thing? Can you hear okay? Huh. Really? Good? Wow, okay. We're on page 47 of my text, continuing verses by Manjushri Bodhisattva. I'm going to kind of carry over some unfinished passage theme from last week. Um, and so we were looking at the verses. The, we already talked about the thus come one, as thus come one is most sovereign. That was the Zudzai, and we had a quite a good discussion about that. Um, the idea also, transcending the world means not renouncing existence within the world, but simply having a free and unencumbered relationship within the world. And then the accomplishment of the perfection of merit and virtue. And these things coming together lead to the last line. It's not for oneself that one cultivates this, but also primarily uh, so one has the ability to cross over and liberate. And then it says all realms of existence. So this is a particularly, I want to maybe pay a little attention to this tonight um, and then see how much we get to. I always want to have a clean break last class of the semester, and then we'll have a fresh break, a uh, fresh start in the fall. It never works that way. Um, there's no closure in life or in sutras or in lectures, at least not in mine. Um, so this, this idea uh, is interesting. It, for some people, it's, it's a little uh, stretches the mind a bit, and it involves all kinds of questions about these teachings, in other words, all realms of existence, because it not only implies that the realm of existence that we are in, let's say as people, um, we take to be sort of it. <laughs> this is the realm of, of life. In the Buddhist understanding, and again, this is not simply theory or doctrine, but rather the result of beings, living beings, uh, particularly <laughs> human beings, cultivating the perfection of their minds and abilities to understand. And with the opening of that wisdom, be able to see very clearly and directly that the human realm of existence is not the only realm that there are not only others, but many others. And so it describes a sort of porous dimension of a, a being, ontology, that at the same time, although there is different realms of beings, there is also a, a continuity in that the plasticity of existence means that one can go throughout these various realms over the span of many lifetimes, many existences. And so it's not like it's clearly distinct realms that have their own coming into being and then their own, but rather it's a interpenetrating, if you will, to some extent, but also um, interlinking and continuous so that Beings, literally, in Chinese, Zhongshan, born from a multitude of different conditions. Um, and this is why, when you really get into the text, the basis for things like compassion and liberating life that are part of the, part of the spiritual exercises, people cultivating this, is this deep understanding that 
all living beings, not just simply humans, have this potential for full awakening. And because of karma and because of longings, desires, and adidya, wuming in Chinese, we don't know living being except those in the higher or advanced sagely paths ever realize this potential so that we are constantly turning back and forth held in, held in these realms by our karma. Sometimes better, sometimes worse. But out of this comes this notion of compassion and that's why this last line is, is significant to cross over and liberate all living beings because there's this, once this is seen, there's this incredible heartfelt, deep compassion that arises for the plight and the potential one sees the plight being what one is, what living beings are stuck in and the potential what they could become and a wish to liberate that full potential and relieve the plight. Um, this seems to come about from the text very naturally and spontaneously with the profound wisdom that a bodhisattva or Buddha has. It, it's not something that has to be generated as an additional thought to their awakening but rather it's integral to the awakening experience. And this is very interesting. It, it implies that then this compassionate regard and the vows that come as a result of this are part of the fabric of full awakening um, and not an additional supplement added on post awakening. And in fact, some of the texts are clear that the very act of awakening, even a priori before awakening happens involves this consideration and engagement um, with living beings. So it's, it's very interesting. Anyhow, the sutras, Mahayana, Theravada, Pali, whatever, have references to these then, you could say, planes or realms of existence. So these are sometimes the words that are used. Um, which living beings are born into and wander through and in and out of what's called through the long night of samsara. Samsara means going on. So literally, birth is not the beginning and death is not the end in this, in this system of understanding, but rather there's continuity. And continuity is the mechanism that's driving this. Um, it's basically karma. I'm going to go into this a little bit. It's not chance. It's not... Um, the whims of gods, or the, uh, the uh, how would you say, the wrath of gods. Um, it is not necessarily even coincidental or haphazard, uh, but has a determining mechanism. So part of the goal of one's cultivation, regardless of saying, oh, I want to escape some sorrow, whatever that means, is to at least be able to begin to have control over the actions and intentions that result in different forms of liberation or entanglement in a very immediate human way. What makes me free? What ties me up? Buddhism has a formula for this, and it starts with precepts that if you are going to get some liberation freedom, it com comes from controlling your actions of body, speech, and mind, and increasingly make them wholesome, unwholesome, increasingly unharmful and harmless and beneficial to others and beneficial to yourself and so on and so forth. This is the beginning of that mechanism. But these texts are asking us to consider not only is this true and evident and useful in what we can observe in our day-to-day -day existence, but this continues over existences, which is an extrapolation, but the principle is the same. We just ask to, I wouldn't say imagination, it's more an inspired imagination to see that this is quite logical that this would continue. Principles of, you know, physics, transfer, what, what's called the transformation of matter and energy, that it's a continuous transformation going on there rather than once created, one destroyed. Transformation is the key. Transmutation is the key. Um, so this applies to these existences. They range, according to these texts, from extraordinarily grim and painful, uh, the lower, what are called the lower realms of the hells, animals, and ghosts, 
all the way up to exquisitely pleasurable, um, fascinating realms of blissful heavens. But the key is existence in every one of these realms is temporary. It's not permanent. Again, this is a differentiation because in some teachings or some religions you have eternal hell and eternal heaven. You do not have that in, in the Buddhist teachings. What you have is temporary modes or realms or planes of existence that are you are in and you are evolving in and through at the same time and they're not fixed and permanent. Um, this, in a sense, is actually a very hopeful prospect because what it means is that not only does everything change, but there's a possibility of changing everything. And that's very different than a sort of fatalist fixed notion. Um, I once made the observation too that it leads to very micro behavior. For example, if you feel you have an enemy and you kill the enemy, you have now gotten rid of the enemy. In this system, you haven't. All you've done is change the enemy into a retribution that will come back because nothing's destroyed or produced. It's rather just transformed. So there is no simple out um, through killing or elimination or genocide or however you look at this. This doesn't get rid of anything. It just moves it into another form of energy, <laughs> which comes back. So again, I remember my teacher talking about even the killing of animals to eat them doesn't, it's not for your health. And it's also that the animals are not gone, but their energy is transformed and comes back in the form of retribution. Now, the text is very clear. It comes back in the form of uh, early death and many diseases. And you can see this from the evidence. I mean, just example, the number of diseases associated with, with meat eating is very, very high. And that is not even looking at it through a karmic lens. It's just looking at it through um, an epidemiological lens. Um, so, in every realm that is temporary existence, no eternal heaven or hell, and then beings are born into these realms due to their karma, or kama if you want to use a Pali. That has, when that, so you have basically Chetana was the intention, you have um, Bipaka, which is the ripening, we talked about this in a previous lecture, and then you have follow the fruit. The fruit itself is then the, the rebirth area. This does not generate karma on its own, it's merely the fruit, the retribution. And when this plays itself out, um, then you take rebirth again elsewhere, according to the quality of your karma. So basically, wholesome actions bring a favorable rebirth, and unwholesome actions lead to an unfavorable one. It's pretty clear. Uh, although the intricacies of this and the subtleties of this are very complex. And we talked about this before. An unwholesome act doesn't necessarily lead to a very determined unwholesome result. But circumstances vary. Um, again, the analogy that was used is a thimble of salt put into a great lake hardly changes the quality of the water. Um, but a thimble of salt put into a teaspoon really changes the quality of the water. So if you think of sort of unwholesome karma as salt and you think of wholesome karma as the water, or if you want to use that analogy, um, you can change karmic results by the contributions you make to offsetting karma, uh, liberating life, holding precepts, generosity, uh, cultivating the way, and so forth. Um, and I would say very importantly, uh, the dharmas of repentance and renewal. This then shifts. And so you have a dynamic, fluid, very lively um, phenomena here in, in the realm of karma. Um, But this is called samsara because driven by various degrees of greed, anger, and stupidity, or avidya and desires, and mixed in with various wholesome acts, 
the, the mixture of this just keeps going on in, in seemingly a beginningless cycle of repeated death, mundane existence, um, and then dying and passing away again, and then coming back into being again. And so generally, samsara is considered to be dukkha, which is unsatisfactory and painful, um, and a kind of sort of reflexive, almost habitually driven uh, prison or unfulfilled human potential. And I think this is a good way to look at this gnawing sense that I am not quite whole and complete. I'm not free and liberated. I'm not all I could be, not in the superficial sense, but in the very deep, profound spiritual sense. There's something that is unfulfilled that's um, gestating, but always just before it can seem to come to fruition, some obstacle or impediment arises, either externally or internally. This is part of dukkha. And this is part of the, uh, the play of karma. Um, now, I want to get into another question uh, we didn't touch on in the last one, which is there's no positing in this system, as far as I understand it, of a changeless soul, a soul that doesn't change, that transmigrates from one lifetime to another. It's very tempting to think of it that way, that there's an eternal, changeless soul that then just goes from body to body, lifetime after lifetime. That is not what the Buddha put forth. Um, so the, the famous Buddhist commentator and author, Buddha Gosha, who um, is also, as far as I know, either the author or the compiler of the Visuddhi Magga, the Path of Purification, um, a very learned and, and I would say, um, enlightened cultivator monk. He suggested that the lack of a self or soul does not mean lack of continuity. And the rebirth across the different realms of birth, such as heavens, humans, animal hells, and others, he, he gave the analogy, he says, it's, it occurs in the same way that a flame is transferred to one candle to another. Very interesting. And he and others have tried to explain the rebirth mechanism with something, it sometimes it's called a rebirth linking consciousness. So it's a, it's a very thin residue almost of consciousness that goes on and then becomes the seed or the, um, yeah, let's, let's just use the seed of the next embodiment, whatever that's going to be. It's not a soul, it's not changeless. Um, it's a rebirth linking consciousness. Um, I've heard other versions of this called intermediate skanda body. So it's a, it's a, thin continuity of eighth consciousness, the, the most subtle form of the storehouse consciousness where the seeds of everything we've done, thought, and said um, exist at a very deep level. That repository of that energy, consciousness energy, it says is the first to come when one is born. So as soon as conception occurs, that's the first consciousness that comes in and actually sets the ground for that being's life. It's not, I wouldn't say it's genetics, but it's a little bit like that. Then it opens and unfolds throughout, but the very seeds are carried over, so it's the first to come. And upon the dying moment, it's the last to go. So the other consciousness in the skandhas of form and feelings and so forth, but that last bit of eighth consciousness, that storehouse consciousness, that what he called the consciousness linking um, consciousness, or the, yeah, the rebirth linking consciousness, that's the last to go. And so it goes. And it goes into a state of intermediacy until conditions come ripe, and then it takes, it enters into a new form. It becomes the... The, 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 the dynamic motivating energy of the new form. 
um, I know this is a little hard to get one's <laughs> wrap one's head around. Uh, I myself, from my own experiences, know that this is true, and I won't explain that tonight. Um, but there is something that continues, and it's very thin. And as it's in con continuity, there is no self associated with it. There's no me or mind associated. There's just a, a awareness. And there is no determination control over it either. It's like a ship without a rudder being driven by waves and winds that you have no control over. But you can feel it's the winds and wave of your karma that's propelling you through this long, dark night. And then, accordingly, you get reborn. OK, so this leads to another thing that happens. Um, when people try to understand this, it basically, the Buddha is saying, do not try to figure this out with your ordinary conscious mind. It is something you will know and see as the purity of your mind increases. And it'll be obvious as my voice is tonight, or I seem to be to you, or he said like an apple in the palm of your hand. You can speculate and conjecture about it, but it is not decided on that basis of whether you believe or don't believe. It's presented to you as this is just the way things are, we don't see the way things are because we're covered over with our own afflictions and limitations and biases and so on and so forth. But as wisdom opens and develops, um, these become more and more obvious. And you see this in the text. There's certain stages of awakening when the cultivator all of a sudden feels and sees, uh, my parents have gone off to this realm, my brother and sister have gone off to that realm. I see and understand in the past I was in these realms. Um, it's one of the powers of, of insight that the Buddha gets upon his awakening is to actually know and see directly his past lives. So this, I mean, if you think about this, this is really amazingly profound because if you had that insight, if you saw it very clearly, think of the impact it would have on your conduct and your, change, and your consciousness completely, the way you lived. If indeed you could see this directly and say, oh my gosh, I, 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 I had this, I lost that, I lost this, I had this, um, I was in these relationships, I was a father of this and son of that, uh, mother of this, and this realm I was an animal, blah, blah, blah. If you could actually see that, whoa. I mean, I could understand why the Buddha might have hesitated to teach upon his awakening, having seen so clearly how this works and then saying, how is it possible that I could even communicate an inkling of this? to anybody who didn't have a direct understanding. They would have to be based on faith or fantasy or imagination or meet with utter um, denial and renunciation that, no, it can't be possible. At different times in different cultures, um, there's more either or less resonance with this, this kind of way of looking at things. But I, I'm trying to say tonight here is that I'm, I'm trying to my best to present what the text themselves and my limited experience and my instructions from my teacher have laid out to me, presented out, and with the idea is not to have who's ever listening totally buy into this and accept it without, you know, a, a confirming evidence, but at the same time, don't just outright dismiss it and take it off the table but rather take a, maybe a third option, entertain it as a possible hypothesis that will be confirmed or not as more data and evidence comes in. And I would suggest the evidence and data that comes in is not just more reading and study, which sometimes helps, but direct understanding coming from one's own self-cultivation. That is the actual mechanism of confirmation. And the Buddha says this very clearly, only when you know for yourself that something is such and thus, can you actually then ascribe to it and, and act accordingly? And so the, the imperative of knowing for yourself implies you can know. Then the question is, what do we have to do to get to the point of knowing this? How do I have to change in order to make conditions possible for my understanding of this? And again, the texts are very clear, simply cultivate. And as you cultivate, this will become spontaneously and automatically clear. So there is, though, attempts, and I, I want to bring this up and I'm with the idea that it's not necessarily wrong, but it's not necessarily right. <laughs> um, 
so if we just look at the six realms, actually there's many realms that are posited. One is just the basic six realms, hells, animals, hungry ghosts, people, Asuras, and devas, the gods. Now, there's another list that lists 25 realms of existence, and yet another list that is 31. I'm not, I'm not even going to go into that tonight. If you're interested in that, you can do some research. It's, it's available. There's many good pieces and articles out there. Um, people in the text that present this, like here or, say, my teacher, talk about these very matter-of-factly and literally. These indeed are realms, as surely as there's Europe, Latin America, Australia, uh, India, and Berkeley, blah, 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 there are these realms. They don't talk about it as figurative language, as imaginary. But people do, without confirming it directly, and without denying it because it doesn't fit some empirical model, some people do, with many religious texts, not just these, do metaphorical interpretations. They say, oh, it's a metaphor. And it's a metaphor for the different states of mind through which we all pass on a given day or a given week. And so there's this kind of using metaphor or analogy or symbolism as another word. For example, I, I just go a little bit on this. In the late 19th century, when Darwin's principles of evolution came and there was now Lyell's principles of geology showing the earth was millions and millions of years old and so on and so forth, the literal interpretation of scripture, I'm just talking about the Bible, um, really got hit hard by what they call the acids of modernity, the corrosive effect of modern empirical scientific thought started to look at things in the Bible that people took literally and said, no, no, you can't do this. I mean, I said, really? The, the earth was created in six days, and so it doesn't make sense, and also it doesn't confirm to modern science. So in order to save the scriptures, um, some people just said, it's poetic metaphor. It's not to be taken literally. It's symbolic. And therefore, you can believe in them, but you don't believe in them literally. Now, there was another group at the time who said, no, they're literal. And science is a passing fad, and it's, it'll be gone soon. And that became the birth of what we now call fundamentalism, which asserts that holy scripture is literal and to be taken literally, and that modern science, especially theories of evolution and so forth, and the agings of things in the universe are... Um, at best, superstitious um, and more like fantasy. So the metaphorical interpretation says, well, hells are times of emotional torment when our lives are really a mess uh, and uh, we're just really psychologically, emotionally ripped apart. That's a hell. And heavens are, con conversely, realms of enjoyment and bliss and copacetic. Um, hungry ghost then would be, anybody want to guess, a metaphor for greed? Yeah, more specifically sort of a, a feeling of yearning and craving that can never be satisfied, an insatiable hunger for food, fame, wealth, sex, sleep, uh, Las Vegas, Reno, um, buying online, all obsessive compulsive, buying, buying, Create, consuming, consuming, well, not even consuming, just acquiring, because you don't consume it, um, and yet there's no satisfaction. So the hungry ghosts are said to have these huge stomachs with very small throats, and they can never get enough to eat. Um, and so metaphorically, that would be that. You could go through the different realms like this. Um, so you could use it in a way to sort of accept the idea of the realm as being a psychological realm of existence or passing states that we go through. Um, and of course, then the human would be per the best qualities of reason and intelligence and so on and so forth. Um, I myself am not opposed to this because all 
actually, these actual realms that they're talked about do come about through states of mind and thought. So I want to be clear about this. But to say that they're only states of realm and thought, I think is dismissing the text's seriousness. And I, I want to go into this. There is a phrase called Buddhist modernism. And I discovered this when I was working on my research um, on Buddhism coming into the West. And what Buddhist modernism does, it takes scientific empirical thought and thinking and imposes it on top of Buddhism and then pulls out of Buddhism that which is psychologically, philosophically, scientifically um, responsive to it. And those other elements, like what we call miracles or the supernatural or rebirth and other realms and so forth, it dismisses as superstitious accretions that came from primitive understandings and peoples. And so they modernize Buddhism to be something that's very acceptable um, and agreeable to modern sensibilities largely based on progressive thought and scientific uh, models. Um, and this is very popular. This is very popular. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, Buddhism is just a form of uh, humanistic psychology uh, for self-fulfillment and self-realization. And uh, these things are kind of scary things. That are, the hells are scary things they tell people to behave, and the heavens are you know, positive things that you tell children to make them be good. But a serious adult um, really understands that this is just metaphor or symbol or whatnot. Um, to do that, to use the, that's, that method of modernism to work with this can be constructive and useful. However, it also deconstructs the, the teachings um, and asks us to reduce them down to our modern contemporary understanding. And I'm not so sure that that is as penultimate as we think it is. There's, there's much to be learned and explored in the possibilities of these teachings than to do this sort of reductionism down to modernist thought. It's very popular. People who want to make Buddhism very popular and accessible to people do this. And you can do it in a skillful way as long as you don't at the same time throw out all the other stuff as being irrelevant, superstitious, and hokey pokey or hocus pocus. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I think we do a great disservice to the text and to actually the whole of experience by assuming that our present standards of viewing and understanding and judging are the utmost and the highest, not only in our own culture, but across the human right now. Um, it's going to be amazing to me. Every new satellite or telescope that goes up is going to come back with, oh, gee, we thought we knew that, but we didn't. Our theories and our ideas have been then thrown up and down again. Um, you see this both in the diggings into the earth, into archaeology, where um, what they think is the evolution of man or what existed at any one time, just say, oh, this has just been thrown out again and thrown out again. All our previous understandings have been turned upside down. You see it at the micro level, but you also see it on the macro level going out into space. And so we'd be probably wise, but I don't know if we can do it, to pause and be a little more humble about what we think we know in the micro and the macro and all in between and keep it open. But these texts present to us a world or a reality that to some extent corresponds very precisely with our modern thought. And at other times, makes our modern thought look a little pale and limited. Um, so here's the question a lot of people ask. If there is no self, no changeless soul, who or what gets reborn and inherits the karma? This is the question that often comes up. 
How can there be rebirth if there's no permanent entity, self or soul, that goes on? If we look at the text, we can see that the Buddha really just used conventional terms when speaking of a doer and deeds and a soul or a self. And rather, more precisely said, what we call the self, what we call the me and the mind, is really five skandhas. So the psychophysical thing that we call mere mind is really a series of five transitory, suffering, impersonal aggregates called skandhas. They're transitory. They're associated with dukkha in the unsatisfactory, and they're impersonal. And they're ever subject to change and rebirth. It's, it's a series of what you call psychophysical phenomena, real but not permanent, which passes from existence to existence during the long, again they use this expression, during the long night of samsara. But those phenomena are not a self and do not belong to a self. That's the difference. It's this very different idea here. So it's not denying continuity. It's not denying something linking. But it's, it's impermanent passing, impersonal phenomena. So that's why the text will say the world is empty of a self and anything belonging to the self. Nonetheless, in this in you know, impersonal collection, ever-changing condition, event, or processes, there's a relatively stable repeating patterns arising that account for the persistence or the continuity of a person's character. And this dynamic pattern, which is a person, is not the same as a self with a permanent soul, but again, a temporary coming together of these skandhas in a particular formulation. Largely, that the glue, if you will, or the, the, uh, the, the animating force behind it is the karma driven by craving and desire. That's what keeps this happening over and over again. The elimination of craving and desire then results in the freedom from that called nirvana. And nirvana does not imply that there's no further existence. It only implies that there's no troubled, unawakened further existence. Let me be very clear about this. Um, so I, I thought about this because I, um, my teacher was really quite interesting in this way, how he played, played with us, because there were some in the, in the group that just hook, line, and sinker automatically believed in the hells, animals, and hungry ghosts without any direct experience to confirm that. They just felt that's what a devout Buddhist b believes in. And they structured their lives and their prayers and their activities around, <laughs> um, I would say, coercing, manipulating, um, imploring, um, trying to deal with this realm through all forts of agencies and, and um, other powers and so on and so forth. And then there were others who just totally skeptically denied it completely and went to the modern, if they stayed, went to the modernist metaphorical use of it and say it's, it's all psychological. You've got to see this psychological. This is the modern mind and so on and so forth. Um, and so I can remember, I, I told this once before, one night one of the young Western disciples asked the teacher, um, to take a position on this, because there was, there was this tension within the community. I would say especially among people who were brought up Buddhist, if you want to use that word, and I don't mean it derogatorily, over time had come to accept these things as absolute truths without questioning them and put a lot of reliance on it. It wasn't necessarily bad, but it, in some ways it kept them from self-cultivation because it pushed all the emphasis on Tali, other powers, rather than on the mind grown self-cultivation oneself. Master Hua was very clear that it's on this mind ground direct cultivation that one becomes awakened and gets out of samsara. These are all expedient devices, and these are kind of, um, what was the word that's used, a sort of 
incentives to practice, but they're not a replacement for practice. So even in reciting the Buddha's name, the key for making it work is not how many times you do it or how fast you do it, but you do it with ishin bulan, with a single mind unconfused. It's the unconfused mind brought into that samadhi that creates the deep merit and virtue that leads to liberation, not necessarily just the repetition, like a parrot. But that being said, so he was asked, is the Pure Land real or a state of mind? Now, for tonight's discussion, we could throw into that, are the hells real or a state of mind? Are the heavens real or a state of mind? Um, and when asked that, Master Wa, is, is the Pure Land real or a state of mind? His answer was, yes. And I, I really, it wasn't just sort of a, you know, rhetorical banter. It's very profound if you think about it. I mean, in, in terms of that. So I just leave it at that um, kind of discussion tonight on this. There's so much more we could go into on it, but I, I wanted to at least broach it somewhat tonight. Um, and also maybe, since neither the monks are here to talk, they're up at Snow Mountain. Uh, which is another realm. Whether it's snowy or not, there I don't know. Mm. But there was a pretty good response to the poetry. Yes, Alan. Uh, mm-hmm. Manipulate what? Manipulate the truth. Manipulate the truth. The truth. And then make assumptions and then attack the person B. So from the person B's perspective, how can that person know that, okay, this is maybe the karma I have done in the past? Is that person A, so now I'm doing that? Or is the new karma that the person A created? So how do you kind of see that relationship and how do So if I understand your question right, it can seem as if, based on the notion that everything that happens to us comes from what we do, which is a a very simple way of stating what karma means, um, there are some things that happen to us that we actually can see come from what we did. Um, My relationship with my wife has really gone sour since I was caught with infidelity. The trust is no longer there. There is an abrasiveness and a souring of the relationship. That came from what I did. Um, You can see it in terms of the environment on another scale. Everything that happened to us is coming from what we're doing. And we can actually link cause and effect in a fairly short amount of time to our human activity of greed and using up the resources of the planet and so forth in a very unrenewable and uh, voracious way, resulting in a return of the reduction of resources, of global warming, and so on and so forth. So it's not like it's a mystery or, my gosh, you know, why did this happen to us? But as you say, there are other things that happen to us that don't have clear causal connectivity to us. Why did somebody just out of the blue see, and I'm using that expression, seemingly out of the blue say, do, or act in this way towards me? Um, I've done nothing to deserve this. And then we, on top of that, out of the blue, put the words like unfair and not just, undeserved. So the the trick with this is the principle continues in this life, in the next life, and in future lives. There's three dimensions to this. In this life, it's called immediate, and generally we can see it. If we're honest and we do a little reflection, we can see 
what happened to me came from what I did. But the problem is that because of all the extenuating circumstances around an event, the return, the pala, the fruition doesn't happen immediately. Nor does it just happen necessarily in the next life. It may happen in future lives. So the, the gap between the actual action and reaction in this system is prolonged over many lifetimes. Therefore, things can happen to us that we seem to think had nothing to do with us and therefore can very easily fall into a denial of causality as saying some things happen by a sheer capriciousness or chance and once you get on that road then you're in a very dangerous zone because by denying cause and effect you actually undercut the ground of your own liberating mechanism to deal with how do you change. If, if things, sometimes it happens because of what I do, a lot of times it happens just out of chance, the whole mechanism sort of breaks down. So you're, you're asked to, on a sort of inspired trust or faith, to accept if it's immediately, I can see it happening. And generally, it happens pretty clearly. I'm asked to extrapolate that and to take it on further. That could mean then Something that's happening in this life now is actually fruition from previous lives or a past life. We don't see the immediate cause, we only see the result now. Even though, like you throw the stone in the water and, you know, almost like a hummingbird, you turn and go. <laughs> you saw it hit, you maybe saw a little splash go and go. And a few seconds later, you come back and you see all these waves and you go, where did all those waves come from? They must have been magic. Because our, our hummingbird time span mind isn't able to see over what wisdom does. It gives the ability to understand karma. Ah, I can see over vast periods of time now. Time has been expanded, so to speak, because my consciousness has been relaxed from a myopic here and now, also expanded. I can see this directly. But until we see it directly, you're right. It seems like it's capricious, it's chance sometimes and whatnot. So you're asked to, as a hypothetical mechanism of cultivation, to take it as a truism and then operate on the idea that reverse engineer, the things that happen to me in their effects must be generated by similar causes. So if anger comes back, comes to me. It must have had a cause of anger in the beginning. If kindness comes to me, it must have been in its causes some kindness generated. If short life and illness come to me, it must be because I took life or messed with life and that would be the cause, the result would be no. So the texts offer topologies of how this works out. But until we're really awakened, it's only theory. But I think it's an important theory. The, the, here, here, what I would say is I'd use William James' pragmatism model here. What do you have to lose by accepting this as the mechanism? It certainly allows you to pay attention to the here and now and be careful. And it certainly allows you to have a calm response to the misfortunes that are coming, and also a sort of mm, soberness about the good things, realizing that these are not permanent, unchangeable, that these are waves and counter waves from actions and reactions and so forth. And so by entering in that, you can, in a sense, start to work it even though you don't see it clearly. But the, I would say the opposite is true if you dis disregard it, then all you're doing is paying attention to the here and now. And this is why the texts say ordinary confused beings only pay attention to effects. They don't see and pay attention to causes. Enlightened beings pay attention to causes and don't worry about effects because they know once the causes are planted, the effects will come immediately, next life, or future lives. So they aren't worried. They're really paying attention. And if you think about it in a kind of a just philosophical sense, it makes a great deal of sense to just be really careful. Everything you do, be right on, be true, um, try to avoid the harm of whatnot. What do you got to lose? 
I mean, this is really, I, I couldn't do it tonight, but there's the end section of the Kalama Sutra where the Buddha actually goes into this. And he says, if there is no fear, there existences. What then? And he gives a very beautiful um, passage to explain why you'd still want to behave in this way. And maybe as we start the fall, I mean, if you remind me, well, I'll start up with that particular part of the text because it's very useful to, to address this question. Is that, I don't know if that helps. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was going to do some poetry, but we is out of time. Um, well, first of all, I want to say there was a really positive response to the poetry section. I did Han Chan and some other things last week, and people wrote and people submitted changes. Um, so I was going to go through some of those tonight. Um, but there's just no time. So I will only do one passage. And then please, people that want to send, send poetry submissions in, and I'll keep doing this every class up when we start in the fall because I really love poetry. And I think it has a concreteness and a visceralness that really complements the teachings. Um, anyhow, I said that. But the one passage I'll share from tonight is actually not a piece of poetry, but more a piece of poetic prose <laughs> to it. Um, and this is from the Zhuangzi, one of my, my favorite texts. Um, the heart of what this is talking about is something that Han Shan talks about. Han Shan talks about people who cultivate and want to understand these things need to find a space of purity and stillness within their own lives so as to reflect and listen to the myriad things going on. My teacher would say, listen to yourself and think things over. But you need a calm and quiet, pure space to do that, both within and sometimes helped by without. So the seemingly withdrawal into solitude or the solitary life or the contemplative life is mistakenly read as trying to escape from the world of reality. But from Han Chan's point of view, and I'd say here again from Zhuangzi's point of view, it's that very retreat that allows us to advance as people in our cultivation and our understanding. It's not like the retreat is a permanent position, but it's a repositioning so we can see and listen and hear ourselves more. This is what contemplative practice is about. Then you, you don't leave the world, but you orient yourself differently within the world and in terms of your karma become much more aware of what you're doing. So the idea of disentanglement, of retreating from and living a more simple life has much more to do with the expansion and understanding of the mind and the avatamsaka state than it is this repulsion and revert, aversion to the world. And in fact, there's no liberation except through confronting and dealing with that. But to confront and deal with that, you've got to have some samadhi power. You have to have some equanimity. You have to have perspective. So in any event, this passage, I was going to read a number of passages tonight along that line, but I'll just relate this one. For Zhuangzi and for Han Shan, and I would say most contemplatives, true freedom comes from not just escaping the distractions of worldly affairs, but escaping the desire for those distractions. Let me say that again. True freedom in a contemplative does not come simply by escaping the distractions of modern life, but rather escaping or putting down the desire for those distractions. So that's why one has to choose carefully what one does in terms of livelihood and relationships, not because you're trying to escape, but rather you're trying to hone in on your desire that keeps you moving you off center. So I read that with this in mind of this story from Zhuangzi. So Zhuangzi was one day fishing when the Prince of Chu sent two high officials to interview him, saying that His Highness would be glad of Zhuangzi's assistance 
in the administration of his government. Zhuangzi continued just to fish. Without even looking around, he replied. So this is wonderful. I see this as a little movie. There's Zhuangzi just fishing, and these important imperial magistrates come up, and the king wants you to join his cabinet, be his press secretary, be his secretary, of blah, blah, blah. And without even looking around, Zhuang's is just sitting there. This is wonderful, and he's not even looking up. And I'm guessing Zhuang's is dressed in pretty rough clothes, maybe a straw hat to keep the sun out. Um, he, re he replies without looking around, I've heard that in the state of Chu, there's a sacred tortoise which has been dead 3,000 years and which the prince keeps packed up in a box on the altar in his ancestral shrine. Okay. So Zhuangzi says, now do you think that that turtle, that tortoise would rather be dead and have its remains honored in that way or be alive and wagging its tail through the mud here? And the two officials answered, no doubt. The tortoise would rather be alive wagging its tail in the mud than enshrined in a box on an ancestral altar. And then it says, Zhuangzi cried out, get the hell out of here. I too prefer to remain wagging my tail in the mud. <laughs> so I, I share that with you tonight. Uh, because it shows that the lure of honor and fame and power, the lure can be a distraction. And they tried to lure him. He was fishing, but they were fishing for him. And he would not bite on that hook. That isn't to say that under the right circumstances and times, naturally acquired, Zhuangzi wouldn't have assumed a position of influence and responsibility. But in that way, coming as it did, total denial of it. Um, so the protection of your spiritual space, the protection of your spiritual integrity, um, your spiritual nature, the text sometimes compared to having a little baby that's just been born. You gotta be very nurturing and protective of it. Um, not only in times to meditate and times to chant and so forth, but even in your ordinary affairs, be very careful not to step into harm's way. Harm in the sense that your spirit gets spat, scattered and distracted and then mistakes are made. So in any event, I, I share that with you tonight because it's in lieu of other poems that I might have read. Um, and we'll keep doing this. Also, it's an intro to I'll surely be wagging my tail in the mud again by going back to Maine at least for some weeks and just sitting um, on the shore in my kayak uh, with my dog, path of words and language cut off, and invariably I will end up wagging my tail in some kind of mud, um, but then be back, um, not to the ancestral shrine, but to Berkeley Buddhist Monastery um, in, when we start our classes up in the fall. So please, if you have other poems or things you want to send in, I might not get a chance to do them all, but over time, we'll just build up a kind of um, portfolio of really inspiring poetry to go with the text. Um, so, is that it? Anything else? Do you want to announce here? Yeah, right here. Yeah, there will be the online Beijing the Buddha birthday uh, next Saturday, not the coming Saturday, a week after. So people can register online. And then our monks in BBN will recite for you and base the Buddha for you. I think the event is fairly early. I think it's at 6 30 a.m. to 7 30 a.m. But feel free to go to the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery website and register. And then that day also will be the three day uh, Buddha name recitation event. And then people can also sign up and then feel free to join you know, any time of the day. And then during that three days event,
people can sign up for plaque. So it's an interesting thing. You can transfer the goodness that you recite the Buddha's name to you know, anyone or to the world. Yeah, so those are the things that people can do. And then I think each person can sign up for two plaques. And please also go to the Berkeley Monastery the website and check out. Can you use a mic for that or not? Okay. But please join in so it's not solo. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness luminous and bright if people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity may our minds awake to great compassion wisdom and to joy may kindness find reward May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Bow in respect to the Triple Jewel.